Hi there guys, welcome to my walkthrough of the OCR MUE AS Maths Sample Assessment Material Paper 2. Now this is the Pure Maths and Statistics Paper, so we're probably going to need the large data set, which I will link down below with the paper and all of my AS content. Hope you find it useful, don't forget to subscribe. Give us a thumbs up, drop us a comment, let's do this. Okay, question 1 wants to find the integral of x squared and 1 over x squared with respect to x. Okay. So, first thing I'm going to do is write the fraction in power form. So, 1 over x squared is x to the minus 2. So we've got the integral of x squared. Add x to the minus 2. With respect to x. Now, x squared integrates to x cubed, and then you divide by the new power. So we get x cubed over 3. Now, x to the minus 2 integrates up to x to the minus 1 divided by minus 1. So that's minus x to the minus 1. And then, of course, I almost forgot, don't forget the constant of integration because we have an indefinite integral. So we got plus c on the end. So we can write that as x cubed over 3 minus 1 over x add c. Boom. Okay, question 2. We have fun with logarithms. So part a wants us to express 2 log base 3 of x add log base 3 of a as a single log for one mark. Okay. So. Okay, so before we can combine these logarithms, we need to rewrite the first one. To do that, we're going to use the power rule of logs to log uh, base 3 of x is log base 3 of x squared. Add log base 3 of a. Okay, then we can use the addition rule for logarithms. So we're going to get log base 3. And when you add logs together, the things in the logs multiply together. So we're going to get a x squared. Boom. Okay. Then part B. For 3 marks. Says given that 2 log base 3 of x add log base 3 of a is equal to 2. Express x in terms of a. Okay. 
So, notice that we are dealing with the same logarithmic expression as we have just manipulated. So if that's equal to 2, that means that uh, log base 3 of a x squared is equal to 2. Now, what that's saying then is 3 to the power of what is equal to a x squared. So, this means then 3 squared is equal to a x squared. Now, we want an expression for x in terms of a. So that means we want to get x on its own. So, 3 squared is 9. So, 9 is equal to a x squared. Divide through by a, 9 over a is equal to um, x squared. And then square root, and we are going to get x is equal to positive or negative. Square root of 9 over a. Now, that is positive or negative 3 over root a. But, we need to be very careful here, and this is a common theme with a level being careful of your answers. X is in a logarithm. And you can't take logs of negative numbers. So X cannot be negative. Because it's in a logarithm. So x is only three over root a. Cool. Okay, number three, five marks. We want to show that the area of the region uh, bounded by the curve y is 3x to the minus 3 halves. The lines x equals 1 and x equals 3 and the x axis is 6 minus 2 root 3. So, this is integration again. We integrate to find the area under a curve um, above the x-axis or between the curve and the x-axis. So, our limits of integration are x equals 1 and 3. So, the area is the integral 
between one and three of three x to the minus three halves. With respect to x. Now, if you like, we can take the constant up front. So the constant is the 3, so we got 3 times the integral between 1 and 3 of x to the minus 3 halves. With respect to x. Okay, so this is going to be 3 times now then x to the minus 3 halves integrates up to x to the minus 1 half and then that's divided by minus one half. Dividing by a half is the same as multiplying by two. So we got minus two x to the minus half. Between one and three. Now, inside of the square brackets, I'm going to rewrite that as minus 2 over root x. Okay. So now I'm going to plonk the limits in. So we are going to get Three lots of. Now, when we put three in, we're going to get minus two over root three. And then we subtract what we get when we put the bottom in. So we're going to get minus minus. 2 over root 1, so that's just minus 2. Okay, so we've got 3 lots of minus 2 over root 3. Add 2. Okay, now let's let the 3 inside. So I'm going to do 3 times 2, which is 6. And then 3 times minus 2 over root 3 is minus 6 over root 3. Okay, so now we need to rationalise that um, 6 over root 3. So we multiply the top and the bottom by root 3. So we then got 6 root 3 over 3, which is 2 root 3. So, finally then, the area is 6 minus 2 
Part 3 has we wanted to show. Cool. Okay, number four. There are four human blood groups. These are called O, A, B, and AB. Each person has one of these blood groups. Uh, the table shows the distribution of blood groups in a large country. So, O is 49%, A is 38, B is 10, and AB is 3%. Uh, two people are selected at random from this country. But A, find the probability that at least one of these two people has blood group O. Okay, so think about our population size here, it's the whole country. So the probabilities aren't going to be dependent on each other. Out of a whole country, we are picking two people. So, whatever happens when we pick the first person does not affect the probability for the second person. So, then we need to think, okay, so we want at least one of these two people to be blood group O. So, the only outcome that we don't want is not O and not O. So, so we don't want um, not O and not O. So, sometimes with probability it's a lot easier to work out the probability of what you don't want and then subtract that from 1 to get the probability of what we do want. So, the probability of not O Well, the probability of O is 49%, 0.49, so the probability of not O is 0.51. So, that means the probability of not O, not O, is 0 0.51 squared. Now that is uh, 0 0.2601. So that me to say the probability of at least one O is one minus zero point two six zero one. Which is 0.7399 Cool. Okay, then part B wants us to find the probability that each of these two people has a different blood group. 
three marks. Okay, so again, it's gonna be easier to think about what we don't want. It would be a complete ball ache to work out each probability that we do want. For example, we would want O, A, O, B, O, A, B. Then we would want A, O, A, B, A, A, B. We don't want to be doing that. So, what don't we want? Well, we don't want O, O, A, A, B, B, A, B, A, B. So there's only four probabilities that we don't want. So, we don't want Probability of O, O. Now that is 0 0.49 squared. We don't want the probability of A, A. Which is 0 0.38 squared. We don't want the probability of B, B. Which is 0 0.1 squared. And we don't want A, B, A, B. So that's 0 0.03 squared. So the probability then of um, each being different well it's going to be 1 minus those 4 that we don't want added together so 1 minus 0 0.49 squared Add 0 0.38 squared, add 0 0.1 squared, add 0 0.03 squared. Wrap that into your calculator and we should get 0 0.6046. Cool. Okay, number five. A triangular field has sides of length 100 meters, 120 meters, and 135 meters. Part A for five marks wants to calculate the area of the field. Okay, so let's make a sketch. Sketches are cool. So, chameleon triangle. Any of the lengths can be any of the sides. So I'm going to go 100. 120. And 135. And I'm going to rewrite 100 Okay, so we want to work out the area of this triangle Now we don't know the height of the triangle So we need to be thinking about how else we can work out areas of 
triangles. And that is with trigonometry. So, let's go over here. So, when you have a triangle, and you know an angle, which we'll call theta, and the two sides coming out of that angle, A and B, the area is one half AB sine theta. Now, we're almost there because we know all three sides. The problem is we don't know any of the angles. So, our first mission is to work out one of the angles. And to do that, we're going to use the cosine rule, which is a squared is b squared add c squared minus 2bc cos of a. Okay. So, back to our situation. So, when I did this, the angle I looked for, for no particular reason, was the top one. So, let's call that angle A. Which then makes 135 side A. So, from that, we can say that 135 squared is equal to 100 squared. Add 120 squared. Minus 2 times 100 times 120 cos of theta, or cos of a. So, 2 times 100 is 200, 200 times 120 is 24,000. So we then got minus 24,000 cos of the angle. So, I need to use theta. Okay, so we now need to get cos of theta on its own. You could have rearranged the formula from the start. I prefer not to, but there is a choice. So, if we add 24,000 cos theta to both sides and subtract 135 squared, we get 24,000 cos theta is 100 squared. Add 120 squared minus 135 squared. Now you could, if you want to, work out what that is on the right. Uh, if we divide through by cos, uh, divide through by 24,000, cos theta is 100 squared, add 120 squared, minus 135 squared, all over 24,000. Now, that will get you that cos of theta is equal to 0 0.257. 
are inverse cos 0 0.257 and we get theta is equal to so I went to one decimal and I got 75.1 degrees okay so now that we know the size of that angle let's draw the triangle again so we now know this angle is 75.1 And the two sides coming out of it are 100 and 120. So the area is one half times 100 times 120. Sine of 75.1 Now that should give us that the area is 5798.3 And that is meters squared Cool. Okay, then part B for one mark answers to explain uh, why it would not be reasonable to expect your answer in A to be accurate to the nearest square meter. Okay, so there's a few things we could say here. Probably the biggest thing we could say is that it's very unlikely that the sides of this field are exactly 100, 120, and 135. Now because we have a 135, it seems reasonable that maybe these lengths have been rounded to the nearest 5. So, that's going to affect our answer if the sides have been rounded up, then we've got an overestimate of the area. If they've been rounded down, we have an underestimate. So that really would be the main reason. We could also say the field probably isn't completely flat. If it's on a hill or if there's a slope in it, that's going to affect the area. Anything along those lines and we are cool. Day number six. The graph of y is 3 sine squared theta for theta between 0 and 360 degrees is shown in figure 6. On the copy of figure 6 in the printed answer booklet, uh, sketch the graph of y equals to cos theta for theta between 0 and 360 degrees. So, I'm going to be a badass. I'm not going to do it on the copy. I'm going to do it on this one right here. Sometimes there's no stopping me. Before we do that though, let's revise cos. Sure, that's the graph of cos theta. So it oscillates between 1 and minus 1. It's the x axis at 90 and 270. So that's cos theta. Now, 2 cos theta is a stretch in 
the Y direction, scale factor 2. So, 2 cos, when you're sketching it really, it's kind of like exactly the same. So, all of the X intercepts are the same, it's just the Y values. So this now oscillates between 2 and minus 2, same X intercepts. And that is 2 cos theta. So, let's put that on here. So, we're now going to start then at 0, 2, which is that 90 degrees is then the halfway point of this first part. So, we're going to go through the x-axis about there. Okay, now the trough is down at minus 2, and that is when theta is 180. So, it's going to be about there. Then the next x intercept is going to be at 270. And then again, it's going to finish up at 2. So, it's going to look something like that, and let's label it. So that's y is 2 cos theta. Cool. So that's how it should look. And for part B and 6 marks, we need to give detailed reasoning, and we want to determine the values of theta between 0 and 360 degrees, for which the graphs cross. So, we want to find the value of theta here, And the value of theta here. Okay. So, first up, then we should probably say that at intersection points. The graphs are equal. So, 3 sine squared theta is equal to 2 cos theta. Okay, so when solving trig equations, we need to get the equation in terms of just one function. So we're going to need one of our trig identities, which is that sine squared and cos squared is equal to 1. So given that we got to cos theta, we're going to turn the sine squared into cos squared. So, sine squared is 1 minus cos squared. So, using that, 
we have now got three lots of one minus cos squared is equal to two cos theta. Okay, now if we expand three minus three cos squared is equal to two cos Now then, this is a quadratic, so we now need to get everything on the same side, ideally with a positive cos squared, with a zero on the other. So, we're going to add 3 cos squared theta and subtract 3, and from that we can get that 3 cos squared Add 2 cos theta minus 3 is equal to 0. Okay, so after some failed attempts and a bit of swearing, it turns out we can't factorise this. So we're going to use the formula instead. Now, first of all, I'm going to make it look a bit more relatable. I'm going to make a substitution. So I'm going to say that x equal cos of theta. You don't have to do this. Personally, I wouldn't, but it might make it look a bit nicer for you guys. So then we got 3x squared add 2x minus 3 is equal to 0. Okay, so the formula, remind you, is x equals minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. So for us a is 3 B is 2, C is minus 3. So, X is minus 2, plus or minus the square root of 2 squared, which is 4, minus 4 times 3 times minus 3. So that's minus 4 times minus 9. That's add 36. And then it's all over 2 times 3 which is 6. Now, we can, if we look back at the graph, we can see that solutions are only positive. So, We only need x, which, remember, is cos of theta, so x can only be positive. Now, 
Sir, X. is equal to minus 2 add root 40 all over 6 now if we plug that into our calculators we get 0 0.72 So now undo the substitution. So this now tells us cos of theta is 0.72. So our first solution is theta. is the inverse cos of 0.72 and that gives us uh, 43.9 and that's degrees so if we go back to the graph, we found this one. Now we need to find this guy over here. Now, by the symmetry of the graphs, if this one is 43.9 in from zero, Then this chap over here is the same distance back from 360. So our other solution is Theta is also 360 minus 43.9 and that gives us 316.1 So there are the two solutions. Cool. Okay, number seven. A farmer has 200 apple trees. She is investigating the mass of crops of apples from individual trees. She decides to select a sample of the trees and find the mass of the crop for uh, that tree. Part A for two marks wants us to explain how she could take a random sample of size 10 from the 200 trees. Classic question. Okay, so I'm not going to write it down, I'll run you through it. So, assign each tree a number from 1 to 200. Set up a random number generator to generate numbers between 1 and 200. Generate 10 different numbers and then select the corresponding trees. Job done. Okay, next up are the masses of the crops from the 10 trees measured in kilograms are recorded as follows. So we have the 10 values and part B uh, says for these data find the mean and the sample standard deviation. So it's only 
two marks and you don't want to be doing this manually. So we need to use our calculators. Now I'm using the Casio Classwiz, which is what I highly recommend you use too. So to, to do this on my calculator, I went into menu, then statistics, which was number six, then one variable, um, and then that brings up a table. So you put in then all of the values, and once you've got all of those in, I then pressed on in the top right. That got me back to the main calculation screen. You then press option and then variable calculations. Now the first screen that you will get is this chap on the left. Now our mean is x bar, so 27. Point six one. That's the mean, and we need to be careful with the standard deviation. We don't want sigma max because we are dealing with a sample. So we need to go onto the next screen and get S X, which is this top guy, bit blurry, but. If we go to 3 sig figs, the standard deviation is 4.04. Okay, then part C wants us to show that there is one outlier at the upper end of the data. And also asks, how should the farmer decide? Uh, whether or not to use this outlier in any further analysis of the data. Okay, so there are two ways that we can classify an upper outlier. So, the first way, let's say, um, Let's call the data x. So x is an upper outlier either or if either So the first one is that x is greater than the mean add to standard deviations. So x bar add to s or Now this second one is the one that first of all jumped to my mind. Or if x is greater than the upper quartile, so q3, add 1.5 times the interquartile range. Now that second um, way is the one that I went for first of all, so that's the way we're going to do it. Because it's also good to point out, the calculators tell us our quartiles too. So, Q1 is 25.1, Q3 is... 28.3 So Q1 
is 25.1 Q3 is 28.3 So the interquartile range then is 28.3 Take 25.1, which is uh, 3.2. So our upper limit is 28.3. Add 1.5 times 3.2. So that's 28.3 add 4.8, which is 32.3, 33.1. So any upper outliers will be greater than 33.1. So let's have a look through the data. So there's our guy. 38.1 is an outlier. Okay, so that's shown that there is one outlier in the upper part of the data. We are also asked how would the farmer decide whether or not to use the outlier in further analysis. So, just because data isn't doing what you want it to do, doesn't mean you can ignore it the whole point of data collection. What she should do is to make sure that this was a um, genuine recording. So make sure there was no error. So it might be that the tree is just really good at its job of growing apples. It might be that there was an error in data entry, maybe the trees were overlapping up the top, some of the apples came from a neighbouring tree. So she should investigate the recording if it was genuine, use it if it wasn't, or if it was a mistake, then don't use it in further analysis. Cool. Day number 8. In an experiment, the temperature of a hot liquid is measured every minute. Uh, the difference between the temperature of the hot liquid and room temperature is T degrees Celsius at time T minutes. Figure 8 shows the experimental data. Okay, so we got D on the vertical axis, time t on the horizontal. Then we can see in general the data is going down as time increases. So before we go any further, let's think about what's happening here. Uh, let's use coffee as an example. When you make a cup of coffee, which I really need to do, when it first comes out of the kettle, it is at its hottest temperature. And then it cools down over time, and it will eventually get down to room temperature. So, that is what is going on here. D is the difference between the temperature of our coffee and room temperature. So, eventually, there will be a point where D 
is equal to zero because the coffee would get down to room temperature and then it's not going to be able to go down any further than that. Okay, so then we're told it is thought that the model D equals 70E to the minus 0.03T might fit the data. But a for one mark wants us to write down the derivative of E to the minus 0.03T. Okay. So, when you differentiate the exponentials, you differentiate the power with respect to the variable. So here we are differentiating minus 0.03t with respect to t. The derivative of that then multiplies the original exponential. So the derivative of minus 0.03t is minus 0.03. So we get minus 0.03e to the minus 0.03t. Cool. That's it for part A. Part B answers to um, explain how you know that 70e to the minus 0.03t is a decreasing function of t. Okay, so we know that d is 70e to the blah blah so d is 70e to the minus 0.03t now then we know that the derivative dt that dt by dt is 70 times minus 0.03 e to the minus 0.03 t. Now remember, derivatives are gradient functions. Now, <coughs> exponentials can never be negative or zero. So, e to the minus naught point naught three t is always greater than zero. But seventy times minus naught point naught three. is less than zero or negative. So this means that the derivative is always negative. Now 
and the derivative is the gradient. So the function has a negative gradient. So is always decreasing. Cool. Okay then, but C wants us to calculate the value of T when, first of all, T is equal to zero. So, when t is equal to zero, we get 70e to the power of zero, and the thing to the power of zero is one. So, 70 times one gives us 70. And then, secondly, we want to calculate the value of when t is equal to 20. So, just substituting t is equal to 20, sorry, t is equal to 20, and we will get to the nearest degree, 38 degrees. Okay then for part D, using your answers to part B and C, discuss how well the model D equals 70E to the minus 0.03T fits the data. Okay, so, first of all then, let's investigate the two values that we just found. So, by the model, when t is equal to zero, uh, t should equal 70. So, let's have a look at the graph. So, t equals zero is on the vertical axis, and the value there is 70. Bang on. So, good start. So, the model Fits exactly. Okay, let's try the next one. So when t is 20, the model says that t will be 38. So 20 is down here. There's our value, if we go across, it's 40. Now that isn't exact, so we could say 38 is, it's very close to 40. Um, so it's very close to 40, so still a good fit. And then for part B, we said that the function is always decreasing. So we can see from the data that D is increasing, uh, sorry, decreasing as T increases. So we can say 
as T increases T does decrease So the model fits well with trend. Now, if we were asked about the suitability of the model long term, then we would have a problem because the model predicts that D will decrease as T increases infinitely. So there's no cap to the model, but we're not asked about the suitability long term. So we should say finally then the model is a good fit with the data. Cool. Number nine, my least favorite question of the lot because it's the large data set and completely boring, but we've got to do it. So, figure 9.1 shows box and whisk diagrams, uh, which summarize the birth rates per thousand people for all countries in three of the regions as given in the pre-release uh, data set. Um, uh, the diagrams are drawn as part of an investigation uh, comparing birth rates in different regions of the world. Okay, so we got Africa, sub Saharan, East and South East Asia and the Caribbean. Part A wants us to discuss the distributions of birth rates uh, in these regions of the world. Make three different statements and we should refer to both information from the box and risk diagrams and your knowledge of the large data set. Okay, so this is taking me back to a level of geography. In general, birth rates are higher in poorer countries because there is less um, birth control and people tend to be less educated in poorer countries, so there's going to be more births. So, with that in mind, let's make three statements and talk about them. Okay, so the first thing that strikes me, the first thing I would talk about is that um, Sub-Saharan Africa has the greatest spread of birth rates. So that means it has the greatest range of birth rates. So that would probably come down to what I just said. Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, is going to have a mix of richer and poorer countries. So, 
the poor countries are going to contribute to the higher birth rates given in the data for Africa. So that's the first thing I would say. Okay, then the second thing that I've noticed is that the boxes for Africa and Asia are of very, very similar size. So that means their interquartile range is very similar. So that really then suggests that for Africa, towards the higher end of the scale, we're going to have some outliers. Again, which are going to come from probably the poorer countries in Africa. So these outliers are skewing the data for Africa. Okay, and the third thing I think I would say is that the Caribbean by far has the um, smallest spread and the smallest end quarter range out of all three regions. Now, for that, we can probably account for the Caribbean being relatively small compared to Africa and East and Southeast Asia. So the variety of uh, wealth between the countries in the Caribbean is probably less spread out than the two regions up above. Now the Caribbean is quite a rich region, so in general uh, they're going to be quite educated, quite wealthy, so birth rates are probably expected to be quite low. Cool. Okay, next up, uh, the birth rates for all the countries in Australasia are shown below. So we have Australia, New Zealand and Papua New Guinea. Part 1 wants us to explain why the calculation below is not a correct method for finding the birth rate per thousand for Australasia as a whole. So, what we've done is added the three numbers together and divided by three. So, essentially we've taken the mean birth rate, or we've tried to. However, this isn't correct. The population for each country is going to be different. So the weight of countries with a higher population is going to be greater. Imagine if a country had a population of 1 million people and another country had a population of a thousand, then what's going on in the country with 1 million is going to be far more powerful, far more weighty as to the overall birth rate. So the answer to this is because we haven't taken the populations of each country into account. Okay then for B part 2, uh, without doing any calculations, explain whether the birth rate per thousand for Australasia as a whole uh, will be higher or lower. Okay, so for this we need to have a look at the data set. So, there we go, the first highlighted row is the first country in Australasia, Australia. 
So if we look at the populations, we can see Australia is by far the greatest population. Now that means Australia is going to have the most weight in the per three per thousand overall. So <clears throat> it's got the highest population. If we look at its birth rate, it's actually got the lowest birth rate of all three countries. So, because Australia has the most people, but these people are having the least babies, that means the country with the greatest weight is contributing less to the overall birth rate. So, the actual birth rate will be lower for Australasia as a whole. Okay then, for the final part of this horrible question, uh, the scatter diagram in figure 9.2 shows birth rates per thousand and physicians, which are doctors, uh, per thousand population for all the countries in the pre-release data set. So we've got the birth rate per thousand going upside and physicians per thousand going along the bottom. Part C. It wants us to uh, discuss the correlation in the scatter diagram. So we can see in general, as the number of physicians increase, there does seem to be a trend in birth rate decreasing. So, it's a negative correlation. And then part D, I discuss briefly uh, whether the scatter diagram shows that high birth rates uh, would be reduced by increasing the number of physicians in a country. Okay, so it's only one mark, I don't need to say too much. Let's think about what's going on, so even over here to the left, even when there's a low number of physicians. In some countries there's still quite a low um, birth rate. So we could say low birth rates are not exclusive to countries with low density I guess we could call it of physicians. So, the scatter diagram absolutely does not prove that increasing the number of physicians would lower the birth rate. We could also say that the data has nothing to do with showing what happens when the number of physicians increases. Anything like that and you're cool. Right, that's that one done, thank god. Okay, number 10. Company operates trains. The company claims that 92% of their trains arrive on time. We should assume that trains arrive on time independently of each other. Part A. Assuming that 92% of the company's trains arrive on time, find the probability 
for that in a random sample of 30 trains operated by this company, bar 1, 28 trains arrive on time. Okay, so let's think about this. The outcomes are either a train is on time or not on time. Events are independent of each other. It's binomial distribution. So, we need to set up in the distribution. So, I'm gonna let T T for trains, you can use X if you want to. So, let T be the number of trains that arrive on time and then T is binomially distributed now N <coughs> is our sample size so that's 30 and the probability is 92% which is 0 0.92 Okay, so bar 1 wanted Probability and that exactly 28 trains arrive on time. So, again, I'm using the Casio classways, which makes things so easy. So, we want the probability that T is equal to 28. Now, on your calculator, if you've got a class with, anyway, go or onto the menu, press 7 for distribution. Now, here, we want an exact value, so we want binomial PD, then you want a variable, now for X, put 28, for N, put 30, and P put 0.92 press equals and you will get uh, 0.2696 okay then for part 2 we want the probability that more than 27 trains arrive on time. So we want the probability that T is greater than 27. Now, to work this one up, we're going to use binomial CD, which means cumulative distribution. So that adds together all of the probabilities from the left up to and including the value that we put in for X. So if we want greater than 27, that means we don't want 27, 26, 25 all the way down to 0. So this is 1 minus the probability 
that T is less than or equal to 27. So, on your calculator, you now need binomial CD, put in X27, and we get that. Uh, the probability that T is less than or equal to 27 is 0 0.4436. <coughs> so we've got 1 minus 0 0.4346. And that gives us zero point five six five four. Cool. Okay, then next up, a journalist believes that the percentage of trains operated by this company which arrive on time is lower than 92%. To investigate the journalist's belief, a hypothesis test uh, will be carried out at the 1% significance level. A random sample of 18 trains is selected. For this hypothesis test, state the hypotheses and find the critical region. Okay, so the critical region is the numbers of trains out of these 18 in the sample that could have arrived on time and lead us to accept the journalist's claim. So, more on that in a second. Let's first of all define the variable again. So again, I'm going to use T. So, let T be the number of trains arriving on time. And I guess we should introduce something for the probability, so I'll use P. Uh, so, and P So, let P be the probability Okay so, for our hypothesis, H0, the null hypothesis, is always the one where the probability stays the same. So, H0 is that P is equal to 0.92. And then H1, the alternative, is the claim. So here, H1 is such that the probability is less than 0 0.92, because the journalist believes the percentage is lower. Okay, so, under the null hypothesis, T is now binomially distributed 
N is 18 and P again is 0 0.92. Okay, now let's think about the significance level. So, 1 cent is 0 0.01. So, let's now think about the graph of this distribution. So, okay, so we know in the sample there are 18 trains. You can find the mean of a binomial distribution by doing n times p. Now what that gives you is the peak of the curve, or it gives you the x coordinate of the peak. So the mean here is, you don't really need to do this, I just want to show you where the graph comes from. So, the mean is 18 times 0 0.92. Now that gives us 16.56. So, our graph is going to look very skewed. So it's going to look something like this. Okay. So, what we want then, to accept H1, our critical region is this left-hand tail where the area is 0 0.01. So, over here, we would accept H1, but over here, we would reject H1. So we need to find the biggest or the biggest value for t that would be to the left of this red line. So I'm gonna call that or am I gonna call it I'm gonna call it T U T upper. So, our biggest value of t that lies inside of that critical region. So, playing around with the probabilities on my calculator. So, I started off with numbers very close to 16, because most probability is on the right of this graph. So, when I did the probability that x was less than or equal to 12 sorry, t was less than or equal to 12 that gave me um, 0 point Zero, zero, two. Now that is less than one percent. 
so that is in the critical region. So when I thought, okay, I'll okay, get one more. So then I tried um, 13. Now that gave me uh, 0 0.012. So, what that tells me is that that is outside of the critical region. Because the probability 13 trains or less are on time is bigger than 1%. So, what that means in terms of our graph is that twelve is just to the left of the red line and thirteen is just to the right. So, our critical region is that T is less than or equal to 12. Boom. Okay, number 11. This one looks fun. So, figure 11 shows the curve y is equal to f of x, where f of x is a cubic. Figure 11 also shows uh, the coordinates of the turning points and the points of intersection with the axes. Okay, so we can see we hit but don't cross the x-axis at minus 1, 0. We go through the y-axis at 0, minus 3. We have a minimum turning point at 1, minus 6. And then we cross the x-axis at 2, 0. Now our mission is to show that the tangent to y equals f of x at x is equal to t is parallel to the tangent to y equals f of x at x equals minus t for all values of t. Six marks, which I think is pretty tight for what we've got to do. So, game plan. To find the equations of the tangents to the curve, we need the equation of the curve. We then differentiate that, substitute in the x value, find the gradient, find the tangent. Good times. So, before we can do that then, we need to know the equation of the curve. So, because it's cubic, <coughs> we can first of all say that y is ax cubed and bx squared Add CX, add D. Now, one of those letters we can actually fill in straight away, and that is D. D is the y-intercept. We know the y-intercept 
is minus 3. So, we actually know then we have minus 3 at the end. Okay, that's probably the easiest part. So, now we need to start thinking fact theorem. So, what do we know are factors of this cubic? Well, we know that roots are minus 1. Now, because we don't cross the x-axis here, this is a repeated root. Now, a repeated root means that you have a bracket squared. So, because minus 1 is a factor, that means x add 1 is, sorry, because x equals minus 1 is a root, that means that x add 1 is a factor. So, uh, because x equals minus 1 is a root, and in fact it's a repeated root. That tells us that x add 1 squared is a factor of the cubic. Okay, then to the other x-intercept. So, over here, we know that x equals 2 is a root. So, x equals 2. Um, is a root. So, x minus 2 is a factor. So, let's put those together and expand and see what we get. So, x add 1 squared is x squared add 2x add 1. So we think of x squared add 2x add 1 times x minus 2. Now if you're not too competent expanding these, use a table. So I'm going to put x and minus 2 down there, and then x squared 2x and 1 across the top. Okay, so let's change colour. x times x squared is x cubed. Minus 2 times x squared is minus 2 x squared. 
X times 2X is 2X squared. That's nice, they cancel each other out. Minus 2 times 2X is minus 4X. X times 1 is X. And minus 2 times 1 is minus 2. Now, that means then that we've got x cubed Now we got minus 4x add x The x squared cancel out So we got minus 3x And then we got minus 2 Now, remember that we said that the constant has to be minus 3 because it's the y-intercept. So, what we've got down here isn't f of x, but f of x has to be some multiple of this. So we can now say then f of x or y is some multiple, uh, let's use k, why not? So it's k times x cubed minus 3x. Uh, minus 2. Now from that, that tells us then that k times minus 2 minus 2k is equal to minus 3. So that tells us k is equal to 3 halves. So finally, we can now get our expression for um, y. So y is 3x cubed over 2 minus 9x over 2 and then minus 3 at the end. So that is our function y or f of x. So, now we want to show that the equation of the tangent at x equals t is equal to now parallel to the equation of the tangent at x equals minus t. So, gradient of the tangent is dy by dx. So, if we differentiate, 3x cubed over 2 becomes 9x squared over 2. Minus 9x over 2 becomes minus 9 over 2. And the minus 3 disappears. 
Okay, so all that we need to do now is find the gradient when x is equal to t and x is equal to minus t. So, when x is equal to t, dy by dx is 9t squared over 2 minus 9 over 2 and 1x is minus t dy by dx is, well, 9 times minus t squared, again is 19 squared over 2, minus 9 over 2. So, uh, equal gradients. at x equals plus or minus t means the tangents are parallel Cool. Okay, the final question, number 12. Given that arc sine of x is equal to arc cos of y, prove that x squared and y squared is equal to 1. Hint, let arc sine of x equal theta. Okay, so if you've never seen these before, arc sine and arc cos just mean inverse sine and inverse cos. So arc sine is just the inverse sine. So think about this. If you take sine of 30, you get 0 0.5. If you take the inverse sine of 0 0.5, you get 30. So, <coughs> if inverse, so let sine minus well, the inverse sine, arc sine of x equal theta. That means sine of theta is equal to x. And that then means that x squared is equal to sine squared theta. Now, if um, <coughs> if arc uh, sine x is equal to theta and then that means because arc sine x is equal to arc cos y this means then that arc cos y is also theta So that means the inverse cos 
of y is equal to theta. So that means that uh, cos of theta is equal to y and that means that y squared is equal to cos squared of theta. Now this means that x squared add y squared is sine squared add cos squared which is one of our trig identities that is indeed equal to 1. So we've proven it. Whack a cheeky little QED which is very relevant because that too is the end of the paper. I hope you found it useful guys. This one seems to be a bit of a bull lick but it's done. So I hope it helps. Take it easy. Take care.